And I really wanted to open tonight with a pithy story or something funny, but I felt like that just wouldn't be authentic to what we're studying here. So I want to tell you about my friend. A couple of years ago, she was in a very toxic relationship with a guy, and he would he would tell her these half-truths about herself. He would basically consume all of her attention, and she wasn't able to really enjoy time with other people, and it just was not really um, adding to her life. And she had so many people who were coming alongside her and saying, you should just break up with this guy. You should not be drawn in by him because you have so many good things that you could enjoy in your life if you just let him go. And eventually she did. She was able to break up with him and she was able to uh, just have so much more joy in her life and hope and the time with friends was so much better. And Paul in this passage is saying to the Galatians that you need to cut off this circumcision party. You need to cut off these people that are basically being these toxic people to you. It would be better if you cut them off. And he's very passionate about it. He's desperate. He's saying, look, Paul, I, Paul, say to you, or other translations say, behold, or mark my words. And then later on, he says, I testify again. He's just so desperate for his friends, the Galatians, to let go of these lies that they're being told to cut off the people that are telling them these things and to just have faith. Paul is watching his friends, the Galatians, stand at the edge of a cliff and he's saying, don't take one more step. And he's getting legitimately ticked off at the people who are saying, just take one more step. He's desperate for his friends. He doesn't want them to be cut off. So he's saying to them, don't be severed from Christ. Be saved by faith. So that's, that's our big idea for tonight. Don't be severed. Be saved. And we're going to go over it in what severs, first of all what severs, and then what saves. So up until this point, Paul has been alluding to a particular rule that the Galatians have added to circumcision, added to the gospel, not circumcision. And now he's plainly said what that rule is. It is circumcision. And this circumcision party we learned about back in lesson four has been pushing the Gentile Galatians to be circumcised in order to find salvation rather than their salvation in Christ. And if you were able to get through Gospel Connection 1, you might understand why some people held this belief. In Genesis 17, we see this covenant that God made with Abraham and these promises that God gives to Abraham, these blessings, and they, he only requires one thing of Abraham, that he be circumcised, that all of his descendants be circumcised. And in verse 14, it says that any uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. So in order to show that they were in God's covenant, Abraham's descendants had to be circumcised. And so this group of people, they've read their Old Testament, they know what it says, and they say, in order for us to be the people of God, we need to be circumcised. You can see the logic jump that they're making here. But if you kept going in that first gospel connection, you would see that the point there was not to be circumcised, it was to follow God's law. The point was to be part of the people of God, and so, requiring circumcision of the Galatians not only missed the point of salvation in Christ, but they're also missing the point of the Old Testament. Paul argues in our passage today that by accepting circumcision, you are trying to justify yourself by the law. And he even says in verse eight, this persuasion is not from him who calls you. Or 
God is not telling you to do this. This isn't from God, and it actually severs us from Christ. In our passage, Paul first talks about what severs us from Christ, and then he talks about who may sever us from Christ. But let's start with what. In verses two through four, Paul tells that there will be three consequences if they accept circumcision. First, Christ will be of no advantage to them. Second, they will be obligated to keep the whole law. And third, they will be severed from Christ. They will fall from grace. So that first one, Christ will be of no advantage to them. Uh, A couple years ago, I owned a silver Echo. Um, It's this dinky little car, which I have a picture of it in there. It's terrible quality, that's from my phone, but it's up there. Um, This was my car for a long time, and it was a fine car. It got me from point A to point B, but it had no AC, so I overheated in our 40 degree summers. Um, It also smelled a little bit of smoke. I'm pretty sure the previous owner was a smoker, so it didn't smell super great, and it didn't have a ton of trunk space. It just, it wasn't the best car, but it was a functional car. And then, a couple of years ago, I bought this car, if we have it up there. This one. This is my Subaru Outback that I talk way too much about it. I brag about this car. I love it so much. Um, It has AC. It has tons of trunk space, so I can put all of my camping equipment or my paddle boards and whatever in there. And it also, the best thing is it has heated seats. (laughs) So not only am I not overheating in the summer, I'm also not freezing in the winter. It's so great. But imagine if I bought my new car, and I just left it sitting in the driveway. I never drove it. I just kept driving my old little Echo and kept uh, overheating in the summer, kept smelling the weird smell, and just kept going around like that. My new car would be of no advantage to me. This is what Paul is telling the Galatians. You have Christ. If you continue to go back to these old things, Christ will be of no advantage to you. So he's saying, don't go back. All of the promises of righteousness and salvation that they have in Christ, they will no longer be of advantage because they're still trying to save themselves. The next thing that he says is they will be obligated to keep the whole law. When I was um, applying for my passport a few years ago, it was back when we still used paper forms. And I know, so old. Um, Just kidding. But we had to use pen. We had to fill it out in all capital letters. And you could not do anything wrong. I had to restart this application three times because I kept putting things in in lowercase letters or just not writing in the right thing. And I kept having to restart because I knew that if I did a single thing wrong in this application, I would be denied. I wouldn't be able to go the place that I want to go. And The following the law is similar to filling out that passport application. If you do just one thing wrong, you will get denied. But instead of being denied the opportunity to go someplace fun, you're denied righteousness. You're denied salvation. The third, but we know we are also unable to keep the whole law. We know that all have sinned. All fall short of the glory of God. That's Romans 3, 23. It's actually impossible to be saved by the law. So for the Galatians to rely on the law would have been me sitting in my echo, but actually it has fully just broken down. It can't get me where I need to go. 
the law cannot get them to salvation. And in fact, Paul has a more severe warning for them. Paul says that if you try to be justified by the law, you will actually be severed from Christ. You will fall from grace. So back to my car illustration, if I leave my Subaru in my driveway for long enough, the battery's gonna die. It's not gonna get me where I want to go anymore. And this is not to say that Christ's grace runs out or that it's no longer able to do what it's meant to do, but if we continue in our life to try to justify ourselves, eventually we will reach a day of judgment and Christ will no longer be of any advantage to us. We will be severed from him. Paul is really trying to pound home for the Galatians that circumcision and being justified by the law are just truly useless when you have Christ. So what laws are you adding to the gospel of grace? A couple of years ago, I had a very help me prayer life. My prayers were help me be more patient, help me be more kind, help me be more perfect according to what I thought perfect was supposed to be. And this is not to say we shouldn't pray for those things, but I would get frustrated with myself when I wasn't this perfect Christian. Or when I did manage to achieve what I was thinking that I could achieve, what I was striving to achieve, that would end up with me believing it was all by my own works. I was doing it by my own merit. So either I was falling into despair or I was falling into pride. But one summer I was reading through the book of John and I was so frustrated because I kept waiting for the thou shalts or the blessed are those who, and I was looking for my to-do list and all of the things that I could achieve in order to earn my salvation. And I just was so frustrated with this book because it was giving me nothing. It kept talking about Jesus. He just kept talking about himself. He was talking about being the bread and the life and the water and the, all of these things. And he just was, kept giving me this introduction to who he was as opposed to what I had to do. And it just fully struck me that he only had three years on this earth to speak to us face to face. Why would he spend it telling me everything that I had to do rather than introducing me to himself, showing me what he wanted to do for me, how he loved me, and how he wanted to die for my sake. And I was so convicted. My help me prayers turned into who are you prayers? Who are you, God? How can I live for you? And how can I know you more? Because it wasn't about what I was doing. It was about what he had done. If you're not a Christian here, are you waiting until you're good enough? Are you waiting until you've achieved enough or been a good enough person in order to accept salvation? If you are a Christian, are you trying to make sure you stay saved? by doing all of the Christian things. Paul's warning is that if you're trying to be saved by your actions, these things will actually cut you off from Christ. You will never find Christ by your own efforts. So Paul has given us this intense warning not to sever ourselves from Christ, but to try by trying to earn our own salvation. And then in verses 7 through 12, he describes the people that are claiming the Galatians need to be circumcised. 
And this is how he describes them. Those who sever hinder us. They're like leaven. They avoid persecution by removing the offense of the cross, and they will bear the penalty. Um, in order to show what he means by hindering us, I, I pulled up this uh, stock photo that um, we should be able to get on there. Um, but there's this picture, maybe it's not in there. Um, but it's this picture of a person that's playing rugby. <laughs> And he's got, he's got the ball, and he's running down the field, and he's going for his goal. Oh, there it is. That person looks hindered. <laughs> this is the picture that Paul has for us. He's running towards the goal, and then these two people come over, and they're trying to stop him from getting to where he's trying to go. And Paul is saying to the Galatians, you have salvation. You have it. And you're running well. Don't let these people come along and push you back. Stop you from running towards the goal that you have been running towards. And he continues in verse 9 to describe these people as leaven. Now, all of us who had our uh, sourdough phase back in 2020, we all know how leaven works. <laughs> you take the little bit of yeast or the little bit of starter and you put it into a big pile of flour and water and that little bit of starter just seeps through the whole thing and causes it to change. Now, I always find it funny when the Bible talks about leaven being a bad thing because I love bread. Obviously, the point is not about the leaven, but the fact that it is a thing that seeps in and it spreads and it changes it. I think we kind of know that this is how people work. One negative person in a room will color the atmosphere of the whole place. So if you have one person who's preaching circumcision as the thing that you need for salvation, that's going to push people one way or another. So these people are infectious. They're trying to keep the Galatians from reaching that goal of salvation, but why are they doing it? In verse 11, Paul says that if he were to preach circumcision, he would no longer be persecuted. So this circumcision party is trying to avoid persecution by going with the crowd, by removing the offense of the cross. They fear man, more than they fear God. It's sort of like their friends are all jumping off a cliff. And instead of saying, that's a dumb idea, they're jumping too. And Paul is just trying to tell them, don't jump. And finally, he has another harsh warning for them, saying in verse 10, the one who is troubling you will bear the penalty. And in verse 12, I wish those who unsettle you would emasculate themselves. What a great line to end this passage on. <laughs> but Paul is really trying to get across the seriousness of what they are doing. In the Old Testament, in Deuteronomy 23.1, it says that eunuchs would not be allowed to enter the assembly of the Lord. So when he's saying it's better that they emasculate themselves, it's better that they fully be cut off from the people of God. He's using their language to say they, it would be better if they were not here so that you could continue in your faith. Paul's not mincing his words. He's saying that these people are toxic and putting your salvation at risk. So, who might be trying to lead you astray? Who might be trying to downplay the truth of the gospel? Maybe it's books, maybe it's podcasts, maybe it's Facebook reels or Instagram reels or TikToks or wherever you watch your videos. Any of these places are going to try to teach you something. What are they trying to teach you? 
my friend the other day was reading a book and she came across this line where it was saying that fundamentally at her core, she was a good person. You're a good person. There's so much comfort in that phrase. I want to believe that. And she felt so much comfort in that moment of just, oh, I am a good person. But there's consequences of even just those little twisting of the gospel, twisting of our own depravity. Because if I depend on myself being a good person, then it will be my means to salvation. Or, what about the days when I'm not? What about the days when I'm not the perfect person? What about the days when I'm not good? The comfort of the gospel is that we are not good. Jesus is good. And Jesus has loved us. And there is so much more comfort in that than me telling myself that I am good. (laughs) I am good because Christ is good. So maybe it's your books, maybe it's your podcast, maybe it's anything out there that's telling you that's twisting the gospel in one way or another. Maybe it's your own fears and doubts leading you to add to the gospel. I was talking to another friend recently who was trying to figure out, as a good Christian, do I need to, do I, do I need to have kids? Do I need to be married? Do I need to work through, do I need to fill out this picture of what a perfect Christian woman might be? And this is, it's, it's a natural question when the world seems to say one thing or another to you. But it's our own fears and doubts that cause us to be pushed one way or another to believe that this is what it means to be a Christian, this is what it means to be saved. So don't let your fears and your doubts push you one way and push you another, but fully rest on salvation in Christ. And then the last possibility is, are you the one that's hindering somebody else? Are you creating so many different checks and spots that people need to meet in order to be part of the Christian family? If you are, there is grace. (laughs) There is always grace, but... I hope that we are able to look at ourselves and say, okay, am I setting standards for other people that they cannot meet and that they never were meant to meet? So Paul has this fairly harsh command to cut off the people, cut off the things that might be leading us astray, whether that's your books, whether that's your own fears and doubts, whether that's checking yourself? Are you willing to cut off the thing that might draw you away from your own salvation? This is heavy. Paul has given us a lot of warnings and really tried to convince the Galatians of the dangers they're in, believing that they can be justified by the law. But he also shows us the hope that we have. So let's talk about what saves In verses five through six, it says, for through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. Paul tells us explicitly that the only thing that counts is faith. Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision matter when it comes to salvation. So do you believe that you are a sinner saved by grace? Do you believe that Christ Jesus has died on a cross so that you could be saved from eternal damnation to enjoy eternity eternity with God? If you truly believe that, you're saved. No more, no less. That's all you need. 
This uh, passage that we're studying is bookended by verses about freedom. In chapter 5, verse 1, it says, For freedom Christ has set us free. And then in verse 13, right after this passage, it says, For you were called to freedom, brothers. So if it's bookended by freedom, we can kind of imply that this passage is meant to speak to what that freedom looks like. So it's not being justified by the law. It's not being weighed down by checklists and do's and don'ts. But freedom in Christ looks like faith working through love. Now, maybe you got caught up on this phrase like I did, where he just said that it's not about works, but now we're working through love. Like, what's, what's going on here? I found the NIV translation really helpful in that it says expressing itself through love. So faith is expressing itself through love. Love is our response to that which we already have. So if somebody gives you a gift, responding with thank you does not pay for the gift. It's simply the way that we show we have received it. So our love is our response to our freedom. And next week, we're going to dive deeper into that response. So I will leave that for next time. But the other thing it says here in verse 5 is that through the Spirit, by faith, we eagerly await the hope of righteousness. This is Paul's way of saying, we're excited for heaven. The Spirit enables us to believe in the gospel, to receive Christ's righteousness as our own, so that we will stand before God and he will say, you are justified. That is our hope, the hope of being right with God and getting to spend eternity with him. I love the song Amazing, Amazing, written by Andrew and Amanda. They were um, right here at Northview, actually. Um, And one of the verses has this line. It goes... In your courts you will greet me. You will find me not guilty. You will look me in the eyes, say, my child, you're justified. Oh, how you love me. You will look me in the eyes, say, my child, you're justified. This is what it means to be saved. I was so struck this week by this beautiful picture of my Savior standing there and saying, I love you. Come, spend eternity with me. I don't think about heaven very much. I don't often eagerly await the hope of righteousness. It becomes a background thought uh, drowned out by the rest of life that is right in front of me. But over the last couple of years, my grandpa has started to get older. Over the last couple of years, his body has started to fail him in a lot of ways. And over the course of his life, he has been a faithful follower of Christ. And the way that he's been talking recently is, I am ready for heaven. He's looking ahead to his future and saying, what I have ahead of me is so good. He is eagerly waiting for the hope of righteousness. And some of us in this room, this might happen soon. Some of this, us in this room, this might happen in decades to come. But if you have faith, you have hope. I talked at the beginning about Paul as this friend who is begging the Galatians not to step off a cliff. And he, we've seen that he is warning them of something even more dire than simple death. He's warning them that they will be severed from Christ and suffer eternal judgment. But he's not talking them away from the edge to turn to simple, mundane life full of different to-do lists than before. He's telling them that to be saved 
is to have the hope of eternity with a loving God. And today I say the same to you. Don't be severed by, from Christ by trying to justify yourself. Be saved by simple faith in Christ and gain the hope of righteousness. Let me pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your sacrifice. That you came, you died. That we might simply have faith and follow you. I pray that whatever to-do lists, whatever checklists we might be adding to your salvation, that you would be able to reveal those to us. We would be able to let these things go and simply rest in the hope that we have in you. We thank you, God, in your name. Amen.